we know, WIPO in 2000 designated 26 April as the World IP Day in order to celebrate and raise awareness about different intellectual properties and and to celebrate creativity and innovation and how it influences the development of societies across the globe. For today's webinar, we have eminent IP scholars, Sir has already introduced, but I'll give the formal introduction to our audience today, who will give their talks on various aspects of IP as influencing our day-to-day -day life. So we have today Dean of Texas A&M University School of Law, Professor Robert Adia, who will deliver the keynote address. Professor Robert is a graduate of Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs and Yale Law School. He is the holder of Anthony G. Busby Endo Dean's Chair at the Texas A&M University School of Law. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of HNU. My hearty welcome to Professor Peter Yu, Regents Professor of Law and Communication and Director of Center for Law and Intellectual Property, uh, Intellectual Property Laws at Texas A&M University. Sir has previously held the Kern Family Chair in Intellectual Property Law at Drake University Law School and has also been the general editor of the WIFO Law Journal. I welcome you, sir. I also extend my heartiest welcome to Professor Shrividya Raghavan. She's a graduate of NLS Bangalore. She has completed her LLM from University of London and later her doctorate from George Washington University. <laughs> Professor Shrividya is currently working as Director of India Programs at Texas A&M. Last but our own Vice Chancellor, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, sir. Sir has three years of teach, uh, sorry, three decades of teaching experience in both IP and legal education field and has been appointed as the MHRD chair professor twice in 2008 and in 2010 subsequently. He has represented India in many global IP platforms as official delegate of government of India and is currently acting as a vice chancellor of Hidatula National University. So keeping the introductions short, because we have already heard as IP scholars and IP enthusiasts, we have already heard about all our panelists, read their works at different platforms. I'll keep the introductions short and I'll rather request Sir, Vice Chancellor Sir, to kindly give the welcome address. Sir, so please. So you are muted. Thank you, Devmita. Even though I had a very informal you know, chat in the beginning. Uh, I think it's uh, it's my duty formally to you know uh, welcome all the guests for this HNLU you know the Texas A&M School of Law webinar, which is conducted under the more established KIP, which is uh, their you know Law and Intellectual Property Division. We are still framing our center, but we do have under a platform called XRK, which really means out of the box where we are inviting a lot of people to come and speak. And so on that, this pro the platform this is being conducted today in World Intellectual Property Day. In fact, I did address a couple of meetings today. So one does not know whether we are really so celebrating happily or we are tensely looking things around us at this point of day, or probably what you call it, this is the time we are going to redefine in a way that uh, how do we look at intellectual property in, in the days to come in post-pandemic era. You know where uh, uh, the world has never faced you know this kind of crisis and so very interestingly that how do we really do this contrast is one thing which we're going to do i thought i'll take five minutes of my time to just give the audience yeah, a little bit of uh, sharing of the screen right and uh, which could be much easier uh, what i call as my lecture itself so four points are really safe if you're not that good in your lecture so uh, let me look at uh, this is what we are planning to do today and uh, i really had no uh, uh, preview with both the speakers except the titles but one thing i know without looking at the preview having heard them a lot of times i think they bring in very thought-provoking sincere and exciting things to the table that much i know so i thought i will just give a little bit of brief to the audience why we chose this particular topic of uh, India and China. As I said, it's an economic tale of two civilizations, I call it. There are two great civilizations. And interestingly, they form 
two fifth of the world humanity. So if I look at the Indian economic history for, uh, you know, other than Sri Vidya or Peter who are very familiar with India or even Professor Robert, that we had a period which was a controlled economy, we call it public sector, where the goal was development and distribution, innovation, where we are not against innovation, but you know, innovation is not a priority. The philosophy suited the goals of development and nation building at that point of time under different prime ministers. Even then, when other Asian economies were turning a new leaf, I would call it in the 70s, but still nationalization was the mantra in Indian context, even in 1980. The growth rate never exceeded 3%, which is referred even often as the Hindu growth of rate, whereas the population exceeded it always. And this was something which many economists have noted down. Five-year planning in the formula of Soviet Union and erstwhile China, and even now China follows, I presume, this was the idea behind a very controlled economy where uh, innovation is not the priority, but distribution and trying to get affordable things. That was the priority. So then came 1991, the crisis, the landmark here in Indian macroeconomics. The remittances from the Gulf countries where India has to get a lot of money came down to the Gulf War. The accumulated deficit showed up. There was just $1 billion which was left in the Reserve Bank in order to meet things. And this is going to be a huge crisis which was going to blow up. You could call it a different economic situation. Panic led institutions to hold back the lending. BOP crisis started a new era of liberalization with a lot of skepticism, I would say. So the tariffs were lowered, reforms started in piecemeal amid stiff opposition. And this is the last 90s to 30 years where also this economics also has a direct link with the way we were looking at intellectual property rights, which was looked very differently in a different era and a different economic thing. I, I, I am a little scared to talk this in front of Peter Yu, but I'll still attempt it. That second largest communist experiment after Soviet Union, ownership to distribution agenda was part of China again. Very similar things and great leap forward, cultural revolution, five-year planning. These were the markings between 49 and 79. Internationalization of Chinese economy as the world's factory starts post-1979. When you look at IP history, just for a little referral, we had the patents law in 1911, 1970, 2005. Look at China. It's strictly speaking, 1984 is one of the benchmark here, what they are really looking. So you, you really find that we entered 95 and China enters 2000. And India's approach to IP, as I told you, Rajagopal and our committee really talked about indigenous, you know, or Swadeshi, we call it. Scrapping of product patent happened, allowed products and processes, but visible gains in Indian pharma and chemical sector, domestic dominance leading to export of generics, and even it got the sobriquet that called pharmacy of the world. China's approach to IP, no historical legal inheritance of IP laws. Single party political ideology provided fresh experimentation. State economy to social market economy. Chinese goods unbelievably affordable to the common persons. Its IP strategy to attract investments and sustain gold starts in 80s after the 79 move. And then to move from cheap to affordable yet quality products, already a leader in the world on patent filings. Why do you, what do I go to say later? The convergence in a way also, China conquered it much better than what is happening in India today, all of you know. Then what about the divergence? That is, I call this tale of two spaces or species, you call it, symbolically, the elephant and the dragon. And what do I know about it? Really, I don't know about it much. If I have to talk to a learned audience, I would like to hear from the experts. Now on, now I would like to move over to Bobby Roberts and he should speak now. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that excellent overview and the theme. Now I'll invite Professor Robert to introduce and give the keynote address for today's webinar. So let me likewise uh, thank uh, uh, all of you for having us. Thank you really for hosting this wonderful event and for the entire faculty and staff <clears throat> at the university for organizing it and participating today. And likewise to my colleagues for, uh, for being here. I am I am confident I am the least of the experts uh, on the on the call, so I'm thankful for uh, uh, Rick's uh, 
introductory remarks and framing. Yeah, I thought, let me just say a couple of words about why I think this is important, an important topic in general, and why uh, it's one that uh, Texas A&M University Law School is excited to be, be part of or to join uh, to join with you in discussing. The, uh, the, the, in many ways, intellectual property represents uh, the, the, in a globalizing world, more on that in a minute, in a globalizing world represents fundamentally the, the, the source of the growth and value we will see. There's of course, lots of real property, lots of other sources of, of wealth that we have, but if we're looking at the trajectory of growth and wealth, which is essential as we have a growing population, uh, as we live in a more complex world, that continued growth in wealth is critical. That growth will come most of all in the context of the value of intellectual property. It will come mostly in the form of the intellectual capital that we are generating rather than other forms of it. And so uh, celebrating in the context of uh, World IP Day, uh, this important topic to me uh, is especially timely and, uh, and appropriate. And we should, and I hope we will together as universities be able to do more discussions along those lines. Um, uh, then the particular focus on India and China, of course, makes special sense as well, uh, given that we really have to acknowledge, and I say this as an American, that we are we are already in if we are not and if we are not in, we are heading in the direction of an Asia centric uh, global economy and an Asia centric global even political order. That's not to say that you know uh, the the European poll and the Americans poll American poll will not continue to be important. But again, if we think about growth and development and expansion and the kind of the dynamism that drives global economics, global trade and global politics, we should expect that to come much more from Asia than from the Americas or from or from Europe. And obviously within Asia, it, the, the centerpieces of that will be India and China. Obviously, there's been lots of dialogue around the axis and the relationship and the interaction between India and China now for 20, 30 years. But I do think, again, especially with the, the rise in many ways of India the, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, China's rise over the last 20 to 30 years, that becomes as interesting and as important a topic as any. When you intersect that with the critical importance of IP, we have a topic that really is so worthy of the attention that it's going to get during this conversation today. Um, for Texas A&M Law School, meanwhile, the, uh, both of the, that intersection, I should say, is particularly uh, appropriate. Uh, for those who don't know, our law school is relatively new in some ways. It's about eight years old now, uh, or at least as a part of A&M University, it's about eight years old. The, uh, and uh, and it, it, is, it has risen rapidly in the rankings and reputation and its profile. And a great deal of that has been a function of the investment in key programs where there is a sense that there is an opportunity for this university in this state to have a meaningful impact. Two of those areas of great importance are intellectual property and uh, globalization, global issues, global programs, international programs. Obviously the two topics that we're engaging today. On the intellectual property side, of course, we have two of my colleagues here and Professor Yu and Professor Raghavan, the, uh, but they join a number of other colleagues, the a large group of other colleagues who work in that space as well and that have really made Texas A&M Law School a leading institution in that arena, top 10 in the United States for intellectual property, technology, and innovation. The, um, so that, that programmatic area is a huge area of interest and priority for the law school, for the university, and really I would say in the state of Texas, given the rapid growth and the economic economy and the technology of the state of Texas. In terms of global engagement, meanwhile, our entire university, Texas a and University is one of the largest universities in, in, in the United States, the uh, first, second, third, depending on the year. It has the largest number of exchange students at any university in the United States. The, uh, so it's very engaged internationally as a general matter. But the law school in particular, both as a matter of programs, but even more so as a matter of our faculty, is incredibly globally engaged. Again, we have two representative, representatives of that the, uh, here uh, from the a and faculty. But again, they are representative. We have a very large group of faculty from overseas, from China, from Spain, from Italy, from Germany, from Mexico, from Israel, and I can go on and on. The, uh, but in particular, from India, the, uh, we have we have a, a cohort of faculty who are uh, who are led by Professor Raghavan, who's here with us today. The uh, but who uh, who really have made 
Texas A&M Law School, a real expert in the area of India. So um, both because of the importance of each of these nodes of our topic today, and because of the connections with areas of programmatic investment and strength at the Texas A&M Law School, I'm excited for us to be participating. I'm excited to learn from all of the panelists today, and uh, I'm grateful uh, for, uh, for you hosting us and for all those who are participating. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Srividya to deliver her talk on the Public Health Country Club and India's attempt to alter the intellectual property landscape. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Uh, let me share my uh, presentation first. Uh... Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's it's such a pleasure to be a part of this, uh, you know, this uh, um, at the World IP Day uh, program that's hosted by HNLU. For for a long time, Vivek and I have been talking about doing something together uh, with Texas a and and I'm glad that uh, you know we're doing this today. Uh, and uh, Deb Mehta, I've heard wonderful things about you from my colleagues, and so it's such a pleasure um, uh, that uh, you're the anchor of the program. Uh, you're one of the brightest stars of HNLU, and I know some of your students. I, I work with them. I talk with them often, Adyasha in particular. So uh, I'm uh, absolutely thrilled that uh, you know, you're know you anchoring the program. It's my it's pleasure my pleasure. My to Absolutely. meet you virtually. Hope we'll host you sometimes in HNU physically soon. Hopefully, right? Um, so as we begin the presentation, it's ironic to be speaking about IP today. Uh, it's ironic given, um, given that this seems to be the time that IP uh, or intellectual property uh, is seemingly one of the biggest barriers, right, today to, to public health. Uh, and it's ironic that we are talking on World IP Day, uh, to the, uh, uh, and we are uh, looking at the trajectory of where intellectual property can move, whether it should move forward, sideward, or backward, in order to accommodate to the needs of the globe. Uh, as we speak, uh, and this happened yesterday, the Biden administration uh, shared the serum vaccine with uh, Mexico and Canada. Uh, but it, uh, but imposed an export ban on raw materials for pharmaceuticals, right? Uh, on on India, right? Uh, at a time when India is uh, literally burning with a public health emergency, right? And uh, and to top it all, one of the uh, you know one of the members of the Biden administration actually said, Ned Price, I, I believe, actually said that it's good for the globe uh, if Americans are vaccinated first. Right, so uh, you know, so so uh, talk about lack of diplomacy. That usually is the kind of thing I, you know, uh, uh, somebody from uh, an academic would say. Um, whether the administration is well within its right to do this, uh, I would say yes in some ways. Uh, Article Twenty One B Three of GATT permits members to act for the protection of its essential security interests during emergencies in international relations. Right, but a pandemic is very, very different. A pandemic is not uh, about a, a bilateral or even global international relations, right? It's, it's about global health. Uh, and so uh, a pandemic requires the globe to act as one, uh, you know, uh, to act as one cohort as opposed to, uh, you know, one on one or, or, or as opposed to getting a, a trajectory there, right? Um, so in some ways, COVID ended up being a response to America's America first rhetoric, right? So uh, America was on a, on, on, on a America first rhetoric when COVID happened. So, I, I, you know, I look at COVID as, um, you know, the, universe, the, the universe's response to a globe where one country was professing um, America first. Right, and, uh, it, it, you know, in, 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 in the way in which COVID impacted the world, uh, pretty much, we know that public health today uh, has, uh, uh, you know, public health dictates trade, public health impacts trade, uh, and 
there is no trade without public health. And if there is one thing that we have learned, right, that trade uh, in some ways is subservient to the, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 the, uh, to how public health uh, behaves, right? So if we look at how COVID has impacted trade alone, uh, there has been a drop both in value as well as the volume uh, of trade. Uh, and, and I only look at 2020 because, uh, you know, obviously uh, the impact of COVID was most on the globe in 2020, not that it's, it's, it's minimizing. I'm, uh, but uh, I, if you look at 2020 alone, um, both in terms of value and in terms of uh, volume, trade has dropped. If you look at different sectors, Say for some uh, couple of sectors like office machinery and, and apparels and so on and so forth, almost every trade, uh, tr every sector, right, that, that, that represents global trade uh, has fallen. And that's true with goods, that's true with many, many services, right? So it requires in some way to, uh, to look at trade, uh, at the impact of trade when the globe is unable to act together as a cohort, right? So this is, uh, this this seems to be the impact on 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 world trade, right? Um, but as we uh, speak today, the the virus, of course, has, has has moved on, and we have different variants of the virus: the B117 in Britain, the B6.1.617 in India, apparently uh, uh, a a more sort of virulent form of the uh, of the virus, uh, and. Um, uh, it's called the double mutant because it, it's a double whammy. It, 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 it has all the negatives of the California variant as well as the Brazilian variant, right? Uh, and the, uh, and India, which had control, uh, you know, very well in the beginning of the, the, the first wave, which was last, I want to say, March, April, is now continuing to rise. And in, in some ways, India has, has, has find it difficult to control the second wave. Partly because of the nature of the variant, and partly, of course, because of uh, the moves of the government. Which, uh, you know, I mean, of course, I think I don't think globally anyone can deny that the the government in uh, in reopening the economy full scale, in allowing, uh, you know, the the kum mela of all uh, of all things, the elections, all of this, of course, contributed to uh, to the race in the uh, in the double mutant. Right, so the uh, obviously the, it has uh, an increased chance of uh, reinfection, and uh, the variant uh, the variant could drive surges in other parts of the world uh, where population's immunity is on the decline. Right, so if you look at India and its response to the post-COVID uh, globe, India was one of the it it was the first country along with South Africa, right, to uh, table. Uh, the uh, waiver from certain provisions of the TRIPS agreement for prevention, containment, and treatment of COVID, right? In doing this, I like to think that India, for the second time, uh, showed leadership at the World Trade Organization and spoke on behalf of the rest of developing countries, right? So the first time was, of course, during the, uh, it was successful, it was the Doha Declaration uh, that, that, you know, uh, and that was during I want to say the anthrax crisis, where 200 Americans were uh, affected by anthrax, and of course America immediately wanted to act uh, because that was 200 American lives, right? And that was the time the globe, the rest of the globe, was being ravaged by AIDS, uh, and uh, India uh, took the effort to, to uh, you know, to, uh, to to show leadership on the Doha Declaration. And right now we have the waiver or the request for waiver from. Uh, certain provisions of the TRIPS agreement, which has been submitted to the TRIPS Council, it's being deliberated by the rest of the globe, and once that's done, it'll go to the GC. Right? The other big aspect of India's action is, um, you know, uh, or response to uh, to COVID uh, from India uh, is, I want to say, twofold, and and has been emphatic, quick, and it shows uh, India's potential to the rest of the world. One is Bharat Biotech, which has. Uh, you know, uh, which has led in the production of Covaxin uh, independently without any collaboration and which has been largely successful. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, it, before the second wave stuff, it was ready to export it to, the, to, to most of the globe, except probably the United States and, and a couple of other countries. Right. The second uh, is Serum Institute of India. 
right? Uh, Serum Institute of India uh, collaborated with the University of Oxford as well as with AstraZeneca for the uh, COVID shield vaccine, which is now, of course, equally popular in India and uh, and uh, also ready for export to the rest of the globe, right? So. Um, these steps have become important and in some ways uh, has a bearing on the waiver that India has sought from the rest of the globe. Um, the waiver, of course, is to promote global collaboration of COVID testing, treatment and vaccination. So the trajectory that this takes is very different as far as intellectual property is concerned. Right? So for the first time, uh, you know, India is looking at innovation from the perspective of global IP uh, as opposed to, uh, a, a, you know, IP from a, from a more sort of uh, a country standpoint. Uh, it has been submitted to the TRIPS Council. It will go to the GC when the minute, because the ministerial conference is not in uh, session. Uh, but the waiver seats obligations or derogation from obligation or waiver from, uh, from certain provisions. Uh, not only from patents, patents, of course, being most important, but also from copyright, uh, data protection, industrial designs and, and uh, protection from undisclosed information. Part of that is because it's to share the, uh, I mean, data protection, uh, of course, is important to share data, clinical trial data on, on uh, some of the uh, issues from the vaccine, some of the issues from testing, and so on and so forth. Uh, and industrial designs, of course, similarly, uh, India wants protection from certain aspects of the industrial de design as well as copyright. I, I'm, I'm hoping Peter Yu will touch more on the copyright provisions, uh, um, probably more from the China aspect of it, but also because of some of the uh, some of the related documents relating to uh, the COVID vaccine. Um, the objective of the waiver that's been tabled is temporary relaxation of obligations to help the government frame a COVID sensitive policy. And I, I want to emphasize that temporary. This is not a permanent measure. This is not India going wild and, uh, you know, wild and out of control and saying no more IP. Uh, but this is India basically saying this is exactly what the globe needs to put trade back on the uh, on the platform in which it was posited to begin with. So that's exactly where India is uh, right now in seeking the, uh, the waiver. Again, I want to highlight this was tabled along with South Africa, right? And South Africa at that time was also facing a crisis with, uh, with COVID. Uh, and one of the things that's not been highlighted, much has been highlighted about the vaccine, about the... Uh, you know, about patent protection for the vaccine and so on and so forth. One of the things that's not been highlighted is um, masks, um, oxygen, uh, and other related things that's required uh, to deal with the, uh, the virus in different parts of the globe, right? So, uh, in response, of course, we've seen other countries raise different questions. One of this is uh, why not use compulsory licensing? Right? And, and it's almost ironic again, uh, and again, that shows the country club attitude, right? Uh, we don't have bread, so why not feed them cake is exactly what, you know, uh, uh, you know what uh, the question of why not use compulsory licensing in Article 31B says. Both compulsory licensing and Article 31B, along with Article 31F, tends to be procedurally cumbersome, long drawn, provides options and, and uh, for other countries to, to uh, you know, to basically raise questions and issues or seek consultations on some of the uh, procedural aspects of it. And we have seen that over and over again, uh, you know, with, with, with different medications, including cancer medications, AIDS medications, SARS medication, so on and so forth, right? And Article 31 B, I think, I think India is one of the one of the countries where much has been written on. Uh, it, India is probably the country where much has been written on the European import ban on, uh, you know, from India and artic uh, using Article uh, 31 Bs for medication. Um, so, so it, it, it tends to be very cumbersome. The other option is why not voluntary licensing? Voluntary licensing did prove to be to some extent successful. But it, in this particular context, voluntary licensing has, has 
proven to be very unsuccessful, right? So Juliet's Ramdes, uh, Ramdesivir has mostly been supplied only for richer nations. What I don't add here is in March of 2020, uh, uh, Juliet essentially tried to get orphan drug status for Remdesivir and Remdesivir, and, and that became a big issue, so much so public health organizations made a big issue out of it, and then Gilead uh, uh, pulled that back, right? So, and no one company, and that's true with Pfizer, with Moderna, uh, and, and, and several of, uh, you know, uh, the, the companies based out of the United States, uh, no one company has committed to voluntary licensing pool of the WHO, and that includes some of the Indian companies. In fact, uh, the chairman of Bharat Biotech was at the uh, WHO week or so back, I think, delivering, uh, you know, his uh, probably a couple of weeks back, talking about whether they could commit to the voluntary licensing pool, right? And much of that depended on whether the world would go with, uh, right, world would go with the waiver. Many of the COVID drugs have been developed using public funding, and that's uh, the, the biggest bummer of all, right? That many of the COVID drugs ha have been developed using, uh, using public funding. That's true in the United States, partially true in India as well. And therefore, it raises that big question, which is, you know, which is ongoing in many countries, which is when we use public funding, right, how can we create uh, you know, uh, how can we create private rights uh, that denies pub uh, public and, and uh, the access to some of these uh, medications? Um, so, uh, you know, as we look at this, th then comes the question of what's the benefit of the waiver, right? Uh, it minimizes the cumbersome processes of both compulsory licensing as well as Article 31 base, right? And one of the biggest cases in point is Canada's uh, bio lease. It's not a. It's not a dispute. It's the. It's the. Uh, you know. It's the. Uh, it's bio lease is a company in Canada. So what Canada? Is, it's a case from uh, bio lease. Uh, they've based. They basically tried to obtain a compulsory license through the Canadian Access to Medicines regime. The Canadian Commissioner of Patents can provide a compulsory license to manufacture and export uh, the vaccine, but the process has several, uh, it's an adenovirus vaccine, but the process has several requirements. So if you actually go into the Canadian process for getting compulsory license uh, within Canada first, using the compulsory licensing statute, which tends to be the first step to begin with. And then, of course, it has to be globally used in several countries, which means other countries have to have to uh, establish statutory provisions to import it, as well as to also license it and so on and so forth. So that's a case in point where Canada is ready to export. The Canadian government is ready to facilitate it. The world is ready to buy it, but still the process has become cumbersome, right? Uh, the waiver, of course, enables the export quickly because the, the IP provisions are waived and makes Article 31 issues redundant. It also removes the risk of forcing technology transfer or using or effectively using the data otherwise protected by Article 39.3, right? So under, uh, the, the, and this refers to the clinical trial data, I already mentioned it, right? It eliminates the risk of a country being, uh, bringing any disputes over non-TRIPS or maybe even non-TRIPS compliant compulsory license or and other exceptions of the uh, of the agreement right so if we look at the background why the waiver has has become important obviously now with india burning and trade being affected i think the waiver has become even more important from uh, you know sitting in the united states i think the rhetoric of the biden administration before the elections uh, makes it even more important that the administration actually takes a step towards, uh, you know, towards facilitating the uh, the waiver. Because uh, when the Biden administration came in, they they, they one of the uh, platforms that they came in on is that they would collaborate with the rest of the globe. They would, uh, you know, they they would go back into the WHO. They would uh, honor their commitments to the World Trade Organization and so on and so forth. Right. One of the biggest things about the waiver is that uh, the waiver makes uh, the waiver now puts the globe on crossroads. Right. For the first time, the globe is confronting a reality where uh, confronting a crossroad where it has to take a position not based only on ideology, a broken ideology that's really not worked in most of the globe. 
right, and should confront uh, and is forced to confront with the realities, right? While intellectual, the ideology intellect uh, of intellectual property it seems theoretically, right, uh, you know, something that the United States and parts of Europe, Western Europe, is hanging on to. Much has been written about the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the uh, you know the. Much has been def uh, written about the ideology per se, including you know documents from Thomas Jefferson's writing to uh, to uh, Mac James McPherson, which talks about public goods being the crux of intellectual property. Right. Much has been written about Bentham's theory. Right. Greatest happiness for the greatest good. We also talks about where exceptions are carved out for the benefit of the public. Right. And so the crux here is to balance. Uh, nobody's against innovation here. Nobody's saying innovation be damned, right? But the the trick now is to find a balance, right? And uh, in order to find that balance, I guess the the most important thing to appreciate that we're looking at an unequally positive world, uh, and that needs to be reconciled, right? So the second question that's come up is the role of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, right from its in inception. Right, the World Trade Organization has been most mostly a barrier to public health and never truly been a facilitator, right, of public health, especially when faced with, uh, uh, you know, with trade questions. It's always looked at its role in a unique sort of normative manner. It's basically said that we protect trade per se, uh, and now trade in some ways is going to be affected by public health. So it's time for the World Trade Organization to 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 look at its role from a sort of inward standpoint. Uh, and it's probably time for the WTO to work with organizations such as the WHO, the UN, UNDP, uh, so on and so forth. Right. Um, so the pre COVID WHO world, of course, very different trade was the fulcrum. We already uh, know that COVID has challenged that uh, uh, that proposition. But most importantly, if poorest countries cannot access vaccine, the world would lose about 153 billion dollars a year in GDP. All high income countries, as well as countries such as China, India, Russia, if, if we include all of that together, they use about 119 billion a year in GDP, and that's approximately 10 billion dollars a month, right? So it's it's really uh, you know for WTO uh, to reconsider its role and to enable equitable access, right, for both healthcare as well as for uh, uh, medication. It requires the WTO to look at more uh, less uh, to look at the you know the trade regime less normatively. Right to look at the national issues, it's never really play, uh, paid any attention to local realities. As uh, and global trade has been the the only uh, you know uh, the only um, I want to say um, uh, focus of the World Trade Organization factors. National issues have to play an important role uh, on issues of public health. The World Trade Organization has been unable to work with any of the international organizations. In fact, when an international organization submits an amicus, the WTO does not, the DSU process merely requires it to accept it and does not require you, it to substantively uh, look at it or uh, take it uh, with more seriousness, right? So all of that has to change from the larger perspective of WTO. Uh, WTO also lacks a, a, a line between domestic and market access issues, and that ties in with, uh, you know, how it needs to look at national issues to to, to read the TRIPS agreement. Uh, and and one of the biggest negatives of WTO is that it's it's always it's repeatedly right justified unilateral actions. The USTR is a great example of that. Uh, and in justifying the unilateral actions, a special 301, 301 case comes to mind, 309, 3, uh, 310 case comes to mind, right? In justifying these unilateral actions, the WTO has preserved uh, some of the power equities, uh, right? And, uh, and that really has to change going forward, right? Um, Big Pharma has submitted that TRIPS waiver will not increase the uh, supply of vaccines. Uh, it raises the question, it begs the question, 
if it's not going to, if you think it's going to be useless, why oppose it so vigorously, right? Uh, and it says a waiver will stifle innovation, uh, the submission at least. Uh, it's also uh, it's also posited some ideological objections, which of course uh, does not stand scrutiny. But the fact that waiver will not stifle innovation has been repeatedly, uh, and this has been uh, a because it's temporary, b because of uh, uh, a because it's temporary, and b because uh, it, it, it's repeatedly shown that in face of a global pandemic or epidemic. A waiver is in order, uh, so much of that has been documented. Much of that already prevailed. So it's time for uh, the United States as well as India to work together on this. With that, uh, just a couple of things, and I want to wind down. Uh, James Bacchus, uh, who's a professor at University of uh, Central Florida and heading a center on trade, and has also served as the chairman of appellate body of the World Trade Organization recently said in the short term undermining private rights may accelerate distribution of goods and services in the long term it could eliminate the incentives that inspire innovation and when i read this and this was one of the uh, submissions uh, he made to the uh, you know uh, 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 through the cato institute in response to india's waiver request uh, the biggest response that one can have is as keynes famously noted in the long run we are all dead, right? And this may be literally true in the case of uh, in the case of um, uh, COVID, right? Um, a, a professor at Al Matra National Law School used to say that law is a Hindu wife to all technology, right? Always seven steps behind, and it's very unfortunate and true that at this time when we have a pandemic, right, um, that law seems to lag behind so much. Right, uh, and it seems to uh, uh, Hindu wives are not like that anymore, but law has tended to uh, to be like that. Right, so the trick is to lead from behind, and India is taking the leadership role, and hopefully India will be successful. With that, thank you for your time. I appreciate this very much, and I uh, and uh, I go back to the forum. Thank you, ma'am, for that enriching talk. Uh, I'll now request Professor Peter to deliver his talk on in, uh, China's innovative turn and the changing intellectual property landscape. Also, I request all participants, if you have questions, you can note them in the chat box. We'll take them up at the end of today's session. Thank you, Dabinha. Uh, I also want to thank VBAC uh, and the other organizers uh, for this uh, wonderful event. Uh, it's always tough to follow my colleague, uh, uh, Sri Rakhavan, um, especially when she's talking about pharmaceuticals. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to give you an overview of what's going on with respect to the changing IP landscape in China. But before I do that, I just want to uh, wish all of you a happy World IP Day. I also want to uh, tell all of you to stay safe. I've been following the news from India, and so that is uh, very disturbing. But at the same time, we hopefully will see a, a better days in the uh, near future. Um, so when Vivek asked me to um, uh, do this presentation, I thought I would just go back to take up some of the old photos. And this actually the first time I met Vivek. And I was in uh, Hyderabad, and it was organizing a conference uh, on, uh, on the TRIPS agreement in 2006. Uh, if you're wondering where is Professor Rakhavan, he's right here, I believe. Uh, he's sitting in the front, making sure all of us uh, are putting together a wonderful event. Uh, but it's a very good uh, 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 trip uh, uh, or a memory lane to go back to see how the cooperation has uh, been ongoing. Uh, your vice chancellor has visited uh, my school um, uh, before, uh, before I joined um, Texas A&M, and I look forward to having uh, Viva come back here uh, to Fort Worth. So what I want to start off with is the old narrative, and actually not that old, it's also still quite relevant. So the narrative with respect to China is always about piracy and counterfeiting, and so I think the slide from here is quite obvious. Some is about pharmaceuticals, uh, the, the, uh, the right-hand side is about uh, CD, DVDs, and uh, uh, optical media. 
and this is the slide where you have uh, President Obama endorsing BlockBerry, uh, and this is uh, actually advertised in China. Um, if you are a big fan of Apple, you can buy shampoo uh, that is actually with the Apple logo. Uh, you can decide whether you want to the white version or you want to have the black version. Uh, this is my famous uh, triple arches, uh, old Mac McDonald's. Uh, that is not the same thing as McDonald's. This is Pizza Hut, not the same thing as Pizza Hut. And this is my favorite. If you cannot afford to have a band, you can actually just create your own. And so you can do that. So this is basically what we have uh, with respect to the old narrative. We always talk about a lot of the intellectual property problems in China. What I want to get you to actually focus on is something that uh, Vivek has got us up here. Uh, it's about the new narrative. And so Vivek in his presentation mentioned that China has become the uh, number one filer of intellectual patents uh, in the world. And that happened in 2019. And this is uh, basically the press release uh, uh, issued by the World Intellectual Organization. And so if you look at the data from the Patent Cooperation Treaty about the international patent applications, China is now number one and ahead of other countries. Uh, India is not too far behind. Uh, India is number 14. So this is a very good uh, way to, uh, to, for you to actually do a comparison and look at the different countries involved. If you look at the companies, uh, China, China has three companies uh, that are within the top 10 in the world in terms of PC application. And I think the year before, China has four companies. So the companies usually fluctuate, but if you look at the top 30 countries of 30 companies that have been filing PC applications, they're quite similar. If you go beyond patents, you want to look at trademark with respect to your matrix system, uh, you can say that China is now number three and move up to number, uh, from number four. And India is also not too far behind. India is right there. And so that would give you some perspectives with respect to the metric applications. And in terms of global innovation index, China is now number 14, right there. And it's quite interesting in terms of how China has been working very hard to move up the rankings for innovation uh, since the global innovation index established uh, way back. And so you can see actually the path that China has been moving from uh, 37th in 2009 all the way to 2020 uh, in, uh, with the 14th spot. And China has been in 14th for the last two years. Uh, based on the statistics from the Chinese IP office, uh, the CNIPA, uh, you can see that in 2008, uh, 2018, uh, the total patent applications is over 4 million. Uh, so it's quite substantial, but I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that we are talking about three different types of patents. Invention patents, that's very similar to UTFT patents uh, in the US. UTFT model, it doesn't require examination. And then we also have design patents. Uh, and if you focus only on uh, invention patents, there are 1.5 million applications in China. And there are about over 300,000 uh, granted uh, from 2018. And for a comparison, I also have the right hand side respective sector from the US. Uh, and so this will be, give you a very good snapshot as a development that China has been doing in the last few years. So one big issue uh, that people usually have is that, but yes, you have a lot of numbers. What about patent quality? And I think the patent quality is also improving uh, in China. If you look at the data provided by the USPTO and the European Patent Office, uh, China is now behind Japan, South Korea, and Germany with respect to the impact of patent ap application. Uh, before uh, the USPTO, and this is based on figure from 2017. If we look at the figure from EPO, uh, China has about 15%, it's behind the US and Japan. Right? So you can see that China has been very active in filing patents abroad at the USPTO as well as the EPO. Uh, in terms of litigation, this is actually quite surprising to some, uh, but not so surprising to others. Uh, China is now the most litigious country in the world in the intellectual property area. And just look at the data from 2018, uh, based on the new patent cases, trademark cases, copyright cases, China has the largest volume of litigation in the IP group. And so that's quite uh, interesting because we always talk about China, how uh, 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 there's no law there and it's not well protected. And yet, if you actually look at data, you can see that there's been a lot of litigation going on 
a lot of them actually filed by local companies. Uh, but at the same time, I think this will give you a very good snapshot of the uh, changing landscape within China. So how did China get there? Uh, what China has been doing is based on uh, law and policy. And so you can see that China has been actively developing uh, uh, the interactive public system. And so we've actually started us off with respect to how China has the first patent statute uh, in 1984 and the turn of statute in 1982 and the corporate statute in 1990. Right? So this slide focuses mainly on developments after China had joined the WTO in 2001. So the patent law has been amended four times now, the trademark law has been amended four times now, and copyright law has just been amended for the third time. And uh, both the patent law amendments and the copyright law amendments will take effect in June. And so this is actually very timely in terms of development. Uh, you go beyond the laws, you can see, find a lot of regulations. Uh, and there's also another slide with respect to different regulations. And this is just in the last decade. And so, uh, this will give you some idea about how China not only has laws, but actually have more laws than a lot of the IP practitioners can handle, right? So I think that becomes a very complex landscape and sometimes a criticism for those of us who are writing about China's law is that China has too many laws that becomes very difficult for us to actually understand the conflict, the tensions, as well as what's going on uh, based on the latest environment. So Hachun Chang, who's a development economist at Cambridge, wrote a very interesting book about taking away the ladder. And the idea is that a lot of developed countries have been using international trade, trade agreements like the WTO agreement and the TRIPS agreement or the free trade agreements to actually take away the ladder for developing countries to climb up. What China has been doing in the past decade or so, or even going back all the way to the time when China joined the WTO, is building the ladder slowly one by one. And you can see a different phases of development that China has imitation and transplantation, standardization and customization, integration, assimilation, and indigenization and transformation. Those are the four phases of development I usually describe. The thing about a lot of the developments here is actually not that different from how India is trying to maximize the flexibilities that are available under the TRIPS agreement, except that the choices are somewhat different. When you think about, for example, Section 3D, China doesn't take the same approach, but at the same time, China has been working very hard in trying to ma maximize the flexibilities and pushing back on a lot of the positions uh, taken by developed countries uh, at the uh, of limit. And uh, as I mentioned earlier on, it's not only just about law, but also about policy. One of the game changers within the Chinese IT landscape is the adoption of the National IT Strategy uh, by the State Council in June 2008. And what that strategy focuses on is what people usually refer to as indigenous innovation. That's actually not the best term if you do the direct translation. I think independent innovation is much better in the sense that you don't necessarily need to have the innovation within the country. You can always buy uh, companies that have a lot of IPs outside the country. I think Lenovo buying IBM PC division is a very good example. The IP there is not indigenous. And yet, because of the purpose, they have become independent from the standpoint of the natural IP strategy. Uh, China has also issued a lot of different plans. I think we have mentioned earlier on about a five-year plan. Uh, and so here is basically a list of the frontier technologies that China wants to focus on. You can see the biotech, IP, advanced materials, a lot of different technology all the way to laser and aerospace technology. And this, the latest, uh, for this plan is called Made in China 2025, which has uh, raised a lot of concern among US policy makers. And you can see a lot of the latest technologies from robotics to new energy vehicles, all the way to uh, the latest development in biotech is included within the plan right here. So there's a strong push to, uh, to focus on research and development in a lot of frontier technology. So what I want to do is to give you two illustrations, but I also want to use the illustrations to actually take you back on the presentation to also write the band did earlier. So the first illustration is to start the pharmaceutical. And I think this will also be quite interesting to the audience here, uh, given a lot of the focus, both in terms of COVID as well as uh, uh, the pharmaceutical sector in India. So China has been actively pushing 
to develop the pharmaceutical sector. And so in the latest amendment to the patent law, China has adopted the Hatch Waxman ex, uh, extension, similar to the US, as well as the provisions in a law future agreement. So the patent term will be extended if there's been regulatory delay for up to five years. And so this is actually something quite interesting in the sense that China has been pushing back on the patent term extension for a long period of time, and now China has finally adopted uh, in the new patent law. China has also included in the provisional measures uh, for testing and protection. Article 5 focuses on uh, providing six years of protection for innovative drugs. And this is actually not that surprising, even though the TRIPS agreement does have any duration uh, for the test data protection for innovative drugs. Uh, when China joined the WTO, China has already agreed to provide protection for six years. So this is actually in line with the commitment China has made with respect to WTO. But what is at the bottom of the slide is the most disturbing as well as the most surprising is that China is now pushing for strong protection of biologics for 12 years with respect to that data protection. So you can see from the slide right here, there's no provision with respect to test data protection for biologics in the TRIPS agreement. With respect to TDP, it was eventually abandoned because of the withdrawal from the US the protection for about eight years. Uh, and five years will be exclusive protection, and then three years will be more flexible. With respect to USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which is a replacement of NAFTA, the protection is 10 years. In both the, chi in both the chi uh, China as well as the US now, the protection is for 12 years. And so this is actually the highest watermark available for test data protection for biological products. So this is surprising to a lot of us writing about China, especially in the interactive world field, uh, especially uh, including myself. Right? In the old days, I always think that China has been picking and choosing the different sectors. Uh, to some extent, the Chinese ID policy has been schizophrenic. China wants to have stronger protection in the fast growing areas, but not strong protection in pharmaceutical, chemicals, fertilizers. But this is changing now. China actually wants to have stronger protection in the pharmaceutical area, as well as for biologic, in the hope of creating natural champions in the pharmaceutical sector. And I think that is going to be uh, very different from what we have uh, in the old NLT. Uh, and if you look at the data right here, this slide uh, is uh, basically from 2011. You do not see China right there. But China now has uh, over 4%. I think it's about 5% now uh, in terms of the uh, share of the world pharmaceutical products. Uh, so based on the figure I got from 2016, China has about 4% right there. And so this is a good comparison. You see how China is expanding the share of pharmaceutical products in the world. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of concerns with respect to access to medicine. And that's why uh, you see a lot of movies and other things uh, in the media talking about the concerns about public health as well as access to medicine. On the slide here, it's actually a blockbuster movie that is very successful talking about how a uh, 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 Chinese person went all the way to India to bring back the drugs uh, to, uh, to be available uh, to a lot of the patients uh, who cannot get the drugs. And this is actually based on this story. Uh, and so this is quite interesting in terms of the concerns uh, within the country. Uh, but China has also been working very hard to increase the healthcare protection uh, for the masses. And so uh, the hope is that, well, if China is going to push for uh, developing a national champions in the pharmaceutical sector, then uh, the improvement with respect to public health uh, will be uh, uh, consistent with that goal, and that will address some of the concern with respect to the lack of access to medicine, especially affordable medicine. But I think the big question at the international level is, well, China is moving further and further away from the position that India, Brazil, and a lot of developing countries have been taking at the international level with respect to pharmaceuticals. Right, so what would that mean with respect to a coalition that we usually have uh, between the developed and developing world? How would we talk about the North South divide? And what would be implications for the WTO and for WIPO? And I think that is something that would be quite important, especially for those of you guys uh, who are in this seminar, uh, because I think that is going to be uh, a bigger and bigger issue in the future, not at the moment with respect to COVID. I think a lot of countries are very sympathetic, and China is actually quite supportive with respect a lot of initiatives, although China did not join the COVAX initiative until much later. Um, and, but at the same time, I think uh, as we continue, I think the position 
with practice pharmaceuticals uh, for China will probably be closer to developed countries than it has been uh, in the past. And there's also a big question with respect to access to medicine. And so this will be a good chance for me to plug a new book by Professor Rakavan and Amaka Bani, which is actually forthcoming tomorrow. And so I think a big debate uh, with respect to the changing position in China will be about the north-south divide as well as the access to medicine. And so that is something that we'll probably have to pay attention to in the next five to 10 years. The second illustration I want to talk about is about artificial intelligence. And because of uh, the focus of this seminar, I also want to tie this together with pharmaceuticals. Uh, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence have been increasingly deployed in pharmaceutical sector in terms of research and development, in terms of female data, uh, as well as in other areas. And so that's uh, quite relevant. So what I on the slide is actually taken from last, uh, uh, the 2019 Global Innovation Index, two years before. Uh, and so uh, on the right hand side, you can see the, 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 uh, the different curve with respect to uh, the healthcare uh, AI type applications. Uh, so the first one at the very top in the pink color is the US. The second one is China. And you can also see India uh, at the bottom right there. And so within the six countries, uh, India is actually one of the six countries that have been very active in terms of healthcare AI type applications. So if you want to break down with respect to the data uh, for a different sector uh, within AI pattern applications, you can see that uh, the different percentage in the pharmaceuticals, medical technologies, diagnostic. So this will give you some idea uh, as to how China has been approaching artificial intelligence in the pharmaceutical sector. One of the uh, biggest concerns, I think, uh, for a lot of policy makers is that China has been very active with respect to big data and artificial intelligence. And so where that will actually change the landscape with respect to intellectual property in the next decade or so, and this will be quite interesting. Now at the moment, uh, I think there are a lot of discussion that's still at the early stages, but at the same time, you already see that the development has been going very quickly. And so I think uh, this will be something that we should also be paying attention to. So what I want to end on is three closing observations. And so I hope the closing observations will be a little bit thought provoking. We also get you some ideas about the different areas uh, of research as well as the different areas of uncertainties uh, for those of you who are practicing IP law. Um, the first one is with respect to the uh, level of protection and enforcement in China. So when China joined the WTO, a lot of discussion uh, is about how a lot of the policy and kind of fitting activities will actually move out of China. To go down, for example, to South Asia, to other countries. Uh, and so, when in the intellectual body literature, we usually talk about the crossover part. Uh, and I have also mentioned that when I was uh, 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 putting together the Whitehall Journal uh, for the first issue. And so, the idea about the crossover part is that, well, there's a divide between uh, countries that actually offer strong protection and countries that do not respect intellectual property. And so, you're on the left hand side, you have the power nation. And once you actually cross over, you can become IP respectful nature. Right? So uh, how do we know that this actually will happen? Well, because we have seen this in history. There was a time where uh, a lot of the British authors actually came to the US to complain about the lack of protection. Uh, we also have seen a lot of complaints about the lack of protection for IP way back in the 60s and 70s in Japan. Right? So you can see that on here, US, Germany, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, a lot of those countries have crossed over. And so now it has become quite respectful of intellectual property protection. I think the question is whether China is going to follow through. The difficulty though is that because China is not diverse, internal inconsistent, a lot of the developments with respect to policy and counterfeiting is actually moving inland. The other parts of the country that's actually not as well developed as the coastal, coastal areas. And so uh, we're going to see a situation where China is still likely still be the biggest power in the world, and yet it is also the number one filer of international patent applications in the world. We have not seen this in history, and we do not clearly to explain how to adjust uh, to the situation where a country is both the biggest power nation as well as the number one uh, uh, filer of international patent applications in the world. And so that is actually quite. Uh, uh, interesting as well as quite uh, difficult in terms of trying to understand 
and to reconcile the complications uh, within the country. So that's the first observation. The second observation I want to share with you is about inequality. That's an issue that's actually uh, due to have, I think, for a lot of the audience, especially when you see what's going on in the developing world, uh, including in India, China, and other places. Uh, and this is actually an ongoing project I've been working on. And so uh, I, here's a plug for a workshop uh, that will be doing a pre-launch of the book. Uh, and you can see that uh, Joe Slickett as the Nobel laureate, as well as the former director general, Professor Stuley, uh, will be speaking at the event. So if you guys are interested, you're welcome to join us in the days May 26 to 27. And Professor Stuley is actually one of the editors of this new book uh, on IP innovation and global equality. Uh, the reason why I mentioned global equality is that if you look at the slide right here, you can see that China has been developing very well in the cultural areas, but not so in the inland areas. You can see that the blue color is in the cultural areas, and then the brown color below me is actually uh, further away from the cultural areas. If you look at this slide from here, this becomes even more relevant uh, to those of you guys who are in the IP grid. Uh, the first three provinces in China, Guangdong, Jiangsu, and Zhejiang, has between 100,000 to 200,000 patent applications, and between 30 to 60,000 patent grants uh, in 2019. If you go down to 18, 19, 20, uh, uh, you can see that the provinces have between 8,000 to about 11,000 patent applications, and no more than uh, 2,300 patent grants. Right. So this is actually quite problem when you see the huge uh, uh, difference between the top provinces in China and also the bottom provinces uh, within China in terms of uh, invention patent applications and grants. And at the bottom, you also see in the uh, right font, there are other provinces and autonomous regions that are actually below what I have uh, for, the, for, the, for the 20 provinces. Right. So this is actually quite problematic when you are trying to think about how to adopt IP policy that's suitable for the entire country. Uh, and this is actually not new to, uh, to uh, uh, not unique to China, it happens to other places. And so I've taken the Global Innovation Index uh, from last year. It showed that uh, Bangalore, Delhi, and Mumbai have been the science and technology clusters within India. And for comparison, uh, in case you guys are curious, I also include uh, streets, uh, cities from Texas, Houston, Dallas, where the law school is, in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and Austin uh, is also included right here. So, geographical distribution, respects to science and technology development and research and development is actually quite common. Uh, the problem is that when you're going to uh, focus on the developments, you can see that the uneven development becomes quite problematic for a lot of countries. So, when we talk about uneven development in the world, we always talk about how one size does not fit all. But we rarely go beyond the global stage to actually look at the national level. Uh, there are a lot of national variations with back to the developed and developed countries and with the North South uh, divide. We also have some natural variations uh, within country, in, especially in a lot of the uh, emerging countries and developing countries. Right? So it's about time we actually think about whether we need to make some natural adjustment of IP policy within the country. And the last observation is about policy. I think it's actually quite important with respect to what's going on. It's also less uh, uh, less easy for me to actually give the, uh, the uh, 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 some thoughts about uh, what type of options we should take uh, going forward. So what I want to do is to use a roundabout way uh, to actually get you to think about issues and that ties to my thought about the US-China policy. And this is a big issue especially in the last administration in the past four years with the tariffs, with all the uh, different debates going on. And what I usually talk about uh, US-China policy, I divide into three different baskets of issues. The first one is about conflict, second is about competition, and the third one is about cooperation. So let me give you an example uh, of how we can actually uh, uh, apply this type of uh, 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 separation uh, between different type of issues. And so I use the example of COVID because of a professor recommend presentation. If there's any issue with back to hacking, uh, so for example, in December, we have a lot of concerns uh, in the US about hackers actually trying to steal COVID data, right? That will be addressed within the conflict basket. 
No, I'm not saying here that I have it actually from China. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's very important for us to realize that there are certain issues that will actually be in the competitive basket that will be have to be addressed either at the bilateral level or the international level. The second one is about competition, right? The uh, vaccine rate is about competition, and there's not much we can do about it. It's actually based on different approaches, uh, different priorities, uh, different needs and interests within the country. And last one is about cooperation. Uh, for example, the release of the genome in Wuhan, as well as the release of genome in Europe, and that's about cooperation, right? If you actually release a the genome, then the scientists, the doctors, the pharmaceutical companies can actually start working on developing the treatments, vaccines, and diagnostics. Right? So it's very important for countries to actually cooperate. The difficulty I have is that we always ask about whether China is a friend or foe, but not actually separate that type of issue. Right? All these all these baskets, uh, they are relevant to uh, any policy making with respect to uh, uh, how to engage with China in the IT area. Right? It's very important for us not to reduce a policy debate to a binary, binary debate, either we actually for it or against it. Right? We, it's very important for us to actually think about the different type of policy that are needed with respect to specific issues. Sometimes we need to cooperate, sometimes we need to compete, and sometimes we actually need to resolve the conflict. Uh, and at the international level, there are also a lot of developments. I mentioned uh, at the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the LCEP or LCEP right here, uh, and uh, in part because it has been adopted last year, but at the same time, uh, India was involved early on until two years ago. And so India is now not part of the agreement, but that agreement is still ongoing, so there's a big international public chapter, and there are a lot of interesting issues there. There's also a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is both interesting in terms of a possible tool for regional harmonization, as well as quite controversial in terms of how it's going to affect uh, some of the neighbors uh, uh, of China. And so that is uh, on the horizon as well. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Peter, you. for that insightful talk from Chinese perspective. There are a lot of questions which have lined up. I will choose some of them and direct you to all the panelists. So uh, I'll start with this question. Mr. Raghavan, uh, I think someone's mic is on, so uh, if you can please switch off your mic. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Raghavinder has asked, uh, compulsory license can be invoked only in event of patented product not being adequately made available by the patent holder, or if it is not available to public at reasonable pricing. Aren't the provisions of Patent Act in India, like Section 4700, which talks about government use, better choice for government to ensure adequate supply of patented drug and medicines to public? So um, two things here. First, we saw what happened when India tried to uh, compulsorily license the Bayer medication. Uh, it leaves the question open or it leaves the, uh, the uh, opportunity for other countries to basically uh, pick on either the procedure or the reason or uh, whether it's warranted, right? So, um, so that's one of the bigger things as far as compulsory uh, licensing is concerned. The other, of course, is within India. The, so the question right now is not just within India. The question is really globally how we make this medication accessible. And for globally making it accessible, com uh, compulsory licensing, while still an option, while still a flexibility, becomes much more cumbersome because it requires every country to statutorily right, uh, impose compulsory license. And then it has to add, uh, you know, exportation and then the uh, procedure for exporting medications and so on and so forth. So it, it does become uh, a more sort of cumbersome procedure, which could delay the, uh, you know, the, the uh, ability to to quickly get the vaccine on to other countries. So that's one of the main reasons. Right? Um, there's another question. Mr. Rishi Raj is asking, New technologies like AI, machine learning, big data are the latest ones in IP sector, which are drawing attention. How soon can we have a clear word from WIPO or any other other countries over uniformity 
in AI based independent IP rights? And what is China's stand on the same? Uh, I think, Professor Peter, you're on mute. Uh, okay, I'm late. Okay. So, the, in China, there are cases where uh, uh, works have been generated autonomously by machine. Uh, have been seeking copyright protection, and that has actually been protected. Uh, and so there's been quite interesting development, and there's a famous Tencent case uh, that is with respect to how uh, there's a, a, a computer software uh, it, uh, that would generate uh, different writings, and whether that type of writing actually protectable uh, based on uh, the intellectual property system. Uh, and so uh, the protection is based on the fact that a lot of the employees from Tencent have been working on uh, that type of uh, software, and that has actually resulted in the creation. And that's why it gets the protection. Uh, but going back to the uh, bigger question is uh, about when MIPO, as well as the intellectual level, I think it's still ongoing. Uh, and this is true with respect to uh, pattern area, with respect to copyright, uh, and also going beyond uh, the traditional IP area into uh, data. Uh, and so that's been going on. And I think the default question is that I think a lot of the policy makers and commentators have been so fixated on whether we actually need a human being to actually be the holder of the copyright or the holder of the patent. Uh, what they've lost sight on is basically what type of human intellectual input uh, that would actually qualify for IP protection. Uh, because there might be uh, a human being involved but at the same time, we still need to ask whether that person is actually writing the software, inputting the data, or actually just uh, uh, owning the machine and actually provide the output. Right? Uh, based on the different policies, uh, we can actually come up with different uh, regime uh, based on our preferences and based on what we believe uh, should be the incentive framework. Uh, so I don't see that uh, being, uh, I don't see any consensus being reached. Uh, within the next five years, uh, because this is an issue that is still emerging. But at the same time, I think a lot of us are actually getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, we have never seen a single machine that's actually capable of creating any work or, or coming up with a pattern autonomously without any human input. Right? So we always think about the scenario where the machine can actually create things on its own, but we have not seen that happen yet. So uh, how much uh, the international community want to spend time engaging in a conversation that's somewhat academic uh, is still up for debate. Thank you, sir. There is one more question for Professor Shivita. Uh, this question, here the uh, candidate has asked, what fundamental changes India should bring to raise its bar and ranking in IP filing? Indians are no less creative than other country because they keep on doing this in-house researches jugad. <laughs> but uh, their innovations and inventions never see the light of the day. That, that's actually a very good question. Uh, and that's true. Uh, even when I'm there, I see a lot of uh, 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 innovation, which is jugad innovation, so to speak. Right. Uh, part of it is because we, uh, you know, there there is no cu culture for of creating that type of uh, private property. It's it's uh, it's developing. I can see that people are uh, right wanting to know more about IP and uh, want, and th there are a lot of people knowledgeable about IP IP now compared to uh, say about five or ten years back. Uh, but it's still, uh, uh, you know, going through the transition, and people are learning about IP. People are learning about private rights and the world value of private rights. Um, so, uh, right, and, and I think Peter showed a slide, right, where India is one of the top six countries that had highest IP activity globally. And that's so true. I mean, on World IP Day, I think India is uh, hosting one of the highest number numbers of uh, webinars as well. So, uh, so in a lot of ways, I think that's, that culture is changing. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think that's the issue now. It's really not that the issue now is for countries like India and China to find to get the world to think about the right balance between uh, you know these two uh, innovation as well as uh, IP. So that's where we are. 
Um, so, um, so I hope that, you know, that clarifies the question. Thank you. I'll direct one question to Professor Peter. Um, Mr. Shamal has asked, uh, do you think civil and custom remedies for infringement of IP in China are up to the mark or they are just for the sake of it? What is the criminal, I think he has restructured the question that way, what is the criminal threshold of China? Maybe he's talking about criminal remedies of in China. So I need to do um, to, and so I, I cannot answer you uh, 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 the second question off the cuff because I fear that I'll actually get the wrong answer about the criminal threshold. Uh, so uh, feel free to email me after that. Uh, but I will address more about the uh, customs. One of the biggest problems with respect to custom enforcement in China is that the intellectual policy is actually not recorded with custom. So there's a lot of times where a lot of IP right holders want to take advantage of all the different uh, available enforcement measures, uh, but they don't necessarily uh, realize that when well, you are not going to register your IP rights with customs, uh, you will not be able to get the protection you need. And so if you are a practitioner, I think that's very important uh, for you to actually um, uh, make sure that your clients are actually aware of uh, the different options. Uh, and I think it was, with a lot of the litigation that's been going on, uh, I think enforcement is actually changing very quickly within China. Thank you. Uh, there are many more questions, but I think we are tight on schedule, so I'll invite Vice Chancellor Sir for his closing remarks. So, sir, is he on mute? Sir, can you hear us? We see, sir. We were just texted, sent me a WhatsApp. So I, I can I, I can hear you. I can hear ah. you. There is nothing much from me from uh, excellent uh, disposition for by both experts on India and China uh, in their respective topics. It has been a great uh, learning for me to listen to both of them and also, uh, you know, uh, Dean Robert to made the initial remarks for this webinar. So from my end, it's a very great thanks of uh, this analytical webinar, which must have been enjoyed by and uh, by a lot of listeners here and we'll give them food for thought about, you know, how do they look at post pandemic this IP play out. So thanks from my end. I'll just invite my colleague Chivan Sagar, sir, for the official vote of thanks. Chivan, sir, please. Thank you, Ms. Dev Mitta, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, all revered invited speakers of the day, <clears throat> Professor Robert Adie, Dean, Texas A&M, Professor Sri Vidya Raghavan and Professor Peter Yu, both from Texas A&M, respected registrar, Turnit faculty fraternity, of HNLU and other reputed schools and the August audience. My heart knows no bound today, having witnessed the conglomeration of various aspects of intellectual property on the given theme, India, China, emerging IP landscape. The joy, it, uh, the joy is yet accompanied with a surge of privilege and pride that ex arca wing of HNLU hosted it. Behind an impressive edifice, there is a wise and experienced architect. Let me thank the architect of this wonderful intellectual edifice, who is none other than our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan. Thank you, sir, for the, uh, from the core of my heart for creating ex arca and for bringing in the best people of the domain. It's a big thanks to all the invited speakers of the day, starting from Professor Albert uh, Robert Adie, Professor Sri Vidya Raghavan, and Professor Peter Yu for the 
unparalleled discourse uh, on the given topic, India, China, emerging uh, IP landscape. The synergistic uh, discernment of yours to open the new vistas and create new faculty of uh, divergent thinking among the audience. It was truly an intellectual agape. My sincere thanks are due to the registrar uh, for all his help. I'm thankful to all the faculty members for uh, taking out their time and attending this great discourse. My sincere thanks goes to uh, Live Law for being the uh, media partner of the day and SSC Online for being the knowledge partner. I'm thankful to Team Digital India and HN, uh, Team Digital at HNLU, uh, led by Ms. Devmita Mandal and uh, accompanied by Dr. Ankita Vasti. Thanks are due to Mr. Pawan Khatri for making this program live on YouTube and other technical assistance. Thanks to IT team and uh, a big thanks to the audience for being here with us. And thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Back to you. Thank you, everyone. That's the end of today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining today, Professor Robert, Professor Peter, Professor Shridhar, Shri, uh, Ma'am. And it was delightful to listen to all of you. So that's the end. Thanks, Bye. thanks, thanks, Devnita, Ankit, and Jivan for you know uh, leading this. And uh, after we log out, I would request uh, our three guests whom I invited for a small chat uh, in the Zoom invite, which I sent to them. Uh, for about five minutes, if they can spare, so that you know we can have some post-connect, you know, meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir.